It, the, the, uh, yeah, she's asking how, what the habitat assessment is assessing, basically. What we're trying to, with the, with the maps and what we're doing beforehand, and that's, that's a lot of spring work. Like, I, I spent my spring trying to uh, assess the habitat. And we will go out in the field and do that if, if there's time or, or money, basically. Um, but what we're looking for is where we think bats are going to be. Not necessarily roost trees, but that is a part of it because where they forage is also very near where they roost, like within a couple of miles. So they're not, they're not doing the 350 mile thing every, every night. They're, they're staying within a couple, like a couple of miles max. And so where we catch bats is usually pretty close to where they're also sleeping. So the main thing that we're looking for is foraging habitat and roosting habitat. So when we look on the maps there, I'm looking for basically good chunks of forest and corridors going through that that's going to work as foraging and uh, roost habitat. Because I'm going to set these up, set those up, and then hopefully find the roost after that. So it's kind of, a, it's kind of everything, basically, trying to find the roosting habitat and the, and the uh, foraging habitat. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're fine. <coughs> yeah, she's asking if we uh, if we take uh, characterization of the roost habitats once they're found. And yeah, absolutely. When we when we walk up to that, it's you know it's a great day, and we. We have a long data sheet that we go through. We go through species, the height of the tree, the height of where we think they're roosting, where we think they're roosting, like if it's a, a crack, a crevice, or, or exfoliating bark, um, the age of the tree, and basically like we take a, a DBH of it, just measure the tree. We take a kind of a small assessment of the immediate area right there, if there's you know uh, other large trees around it, or if it's a young or old forest. Um, a long list of things that we that we go through. We mark the points so that obviously we know exactly where it is, and so that we it can we can come back if need to, or if we need to manage that that part for for the project we're working on. If we need to, you know, let the client know that you know you've got a roost tree here, you need to either buffer or change change boundaries. So um, yeah, so yeah, that's a, it's a very it's a very intense. I mean, we go from setting those up, and then I mean, it's a very lengthy process too. And we the reason why bat surveys are pretty crazy is because we have that three month window and we have to get all of these surveys done within that three month window and you know for some projects if you have a project with 200 sites that means 200 sites with these out there and then we have to if we get a positive we have to do follow up mist nets and those are two nights every time you get a positive hit you have to do two nights and so that's if we get the mist netting that's now you're on four nights and then if you do the telemetry that's another week and and then we have to do emergence counts, and that's two nights as well. So there's a lot of lot of work to do, and a lot of people out here with me right now doing this work to to try and find them all. Let's see what I got left here. Threats to bats. So I'll jump into this. I think we're we're doing pretty good on time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, white nose. I'm gonna just jump right into white nose because this is the this is the main one. This is this is why we're up here in in Minnesota is because white nose is. Uh, you know, killed off so many bats and and made the Fish and Wildlife and and other agencies propose to list uh, northern long-eared bats as endangered species. So um, it has been confirmed, and this was um, confirmed in you guys help me out here, Sudan Underground Mine State Park. Yeah, all right, good. And uh, Forestville Mystery Cave State Park, and those are kind of the two extremes, right? Is that northeast Minnesota, right on the Canada border, and then southeast, if I'm if I'm recalling, and I'll show you guys on a map. But it has been confirmed there, and uh, it's been that's it for Minnesota right now. Aiken doesn't have it, but it's uh, always advised to try and do those kind of kind of surveys, trying to find those portals and everything. And uh, hopefully we can do that. It's spreading westward. It started in the New York area, and uh, probably just by like I said, neighbors from from England or Europe or something that you know they had no idea that they had fungal spores on their equipment, and then they brought it over, and it was a environment that was very suitable for this for this fungus to to grow and it's grown and grown and grown and grown um, latest estimate is about 5.7 million bats just in eastern north america alone and so that number is growing fast and moving westward once it reaches uh, a hibernation site it can be 90 to 100 percent uh, mortality rate 
and that's that's very high. So if you're not having any survivors in that in that hibernaculum, then it's very devastating for those losses. Uh, one of the reasons um, it's so devastating is for like Indiana bats, where they cluster together in in sometimes hundreds of thousands of bats. If though if white nose reaches those spots, it's almost an extinction level event uh, for those bats because. Uh, they cluster together in such large numbers. Northern long-eared bats won't be in the hundreds of thousands together, but they will get thousands of bats together, but it won't be as great in numbers, but it'll take longer, but it is killing them off. And you know, there's a lot more caves and mines and stuff in, North, in the Northeast America, but um, that's where it's a lot more prevalent. But if it reaches, you know, Indiana bats, for example, they, they hibernate in, just, uh, in large numbers in just a few caves and mines in Southern Indiana and Southern Illinois. White nose hasn't reached those caves or, or mines yet, and there's a lot of work going into <laughs> help help that. But uh, it it will eventually meet uh, get there, and once it reaches down there, that's it's going to be really hard to keep Indiana bats going. And they're they they've been doing well up until white nose. Their numbers were coming back, and we were seeing a steady growth from Indiana bats. But now that white nose is uh, hit so hard, it's going to be hard to keep Indiana bats. That's why I think a lot of the uh, shift has gone on to northern long-eared bats. It's because there's, their numbers are still high, and hopefully we can conserve them while they're still here. And you know, it's not given up on Indiana bats by any means, but it's it, it, once it reaches there, it's going to be uh, hard to keep up with them. You had a question, and then I'll get to you. Uh, let's take a look at the map. I think it's I think it was two, 2010. Uh, he says, "How long has White Nose been in in Minnesota?" So here, actually, we can look at this map here. So yeah, 20. 2010 for up there, and then this one was kind of that color, so that was just last year, it looks like, or two years ago, I guess, 2012, 2013. They go and do those winter surveys, so, you know, in the, in the winter of 2012 and 2013. But so here's a, uh, here, and sorry, you had a question. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Or, Yeah, it's it's kind of hard to do that because um, they're all. It also stays on them while they're flying around, and so when we're out and doing these surveys, we have very strict decontamination protocols that we do. We wear rubber gloves. We only have once we handle a bat, we take that glove off and we use a new rubber glove. We have bags that we hold them in every new bag, and we uh, decontaminate our nets, our poles, and all of our equipment. And so it can it can spread by. I mean, it's just spores, like you know, micro spores. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, there's not. There's. It's. It's. There's a lot of research and a lot of money going towards it, but that's 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 been proposed, but it hasn't. See, they haven't found anything that kills off that specific fungus and doesn't and doesn't affect the climate and the the specific requirements that those bats. Because if they go in there and the their requirements are not met, they're going to move to a different cave. And then if that one uh, has it, then we don't know. You know, for example, I'm telling you about caves and mines that we know a lot about. There's probably hundreds, if not thousands, of caves and mines that we don't know about that bats are using to to hibernate in. Same with, with houses and barns. They'll use those as well, not just caves and mines. So if we don't know everywhere that the that they're going and everywhere that the fungus is, then it's really hard to stop. No, no problem. Yeah. It, it, Exactly. Yeah, and it, it's, it lays dormant during that time, but then it, it, it can come back and and affect them during the winter, and that's when it grows and spreads and really does a lot of damage. But that's why we why we do the decontamination so stro stro stringently, and he's he's one of our guys that does a lot of that. So, are all bats at risk of white nose, and is there some that's more resistant? So there's uh, this is it pertains to the hibernating bats. So the bats that uh, big browns for for minute the big browns the little browns long ear bats and the tricolored and I think that was it uh, those bats that migrate they're they're pretty solo bats so they're going to be 
uh, by themselves and they're not coming into contact a lot unless, you know, during mating and stuff, but um, they're not going into caves either. Those are the ones that will migrate south and then roll up in leaves and, and migrate or hibernate on the ground. So there's not really a risk of, of them coming into contact with it. The only risk that we could see is potentially like catching them in our nets and getting it there. But um, again, that climate would have to be perfect when they're rolled up on the ground for the, the fungus to grow. So, yes, ma'am. Not, not, not that, has there been any findings of reducing the fungus? And no, not at this time, there hasn't. And, and uh, I recommend you guys go to uh, whitenosesyndrome.org, I believe it is, and that's where the fish and wildlife and all the, the funding is, is going towards that. And that's where this map came from and everything. And they've got a lot of uh, good resources on there about, about the fungus and about the research going on in there. There's a lot of different uh, people and a lot of different a lot of money going towards that right now because it's such a, a big deal and it's killing off a lot of bats. So, yes, ma'am. Yeah, I know, but it's, they've had probably millennia to to acclimate to that, you know, and it probably wasn't like a it probably wasn't a, a sudden event where all of a sudden, hey, we've got this fungus here. They probably evolved with the fungus present in the caves already, so they never really had to uh, fight it. They they just no, no, they have different species. And, and America has different species, and it's very, very distinctly split kind of at the Rocky Mountains. Like I said, North Dakota will get species that we don't have uh, over in New York or Indiana. And same with, uh, with you know, Colorado. We don't have some of the bats, like big, big browns and, and uh, red bats and hoary bats will be all across America. But then those bats, especially the ones more susceptible to white nose, are not uh, cross country. So, yes, sir. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, we are. We've, uh, I don't think we've caught any of the tricolors, but all the rest of those bats that I showed you we have caught. We've caught a lot of northern long-eared bats. We've caught uh, little browns and big browns, some reds, and some hoaries and silver hairs, and that's, that's pretty much it, if I recall. Was that six? Yeah, I don't think we've caught any tricolors yet, have we? Do you know of? Yeah, I don't. And usually we, and those are, uh, that's kind of expected. Those are the Common bats, the big browns and little browns are, are usually common. Those are the ones that you'll find in barns and, and uh, houses and stuff, and those are the ones that we'll, we'll always find usually. Um, and northern long-eared bats for now are doing, are doing pretty well up here from, from what we've been finding. Um, yeah. So like, let's, uh, let's see where I was at. Yeah, so that's what it looks like, and why obviously why it was called white nose. That's just a small part of it. It's spread all across there. The spores are eating away at it. I don't have any pictures of wing damage, but when we do catch bats, we are looking to see if there's any wing damage to see if it's, uh, we have like kind of a, a scorecard of zero to three basically of how severe their wing damage is because it is a really thin membrane and it does tear naturally and they do get injuries and stuff. But if there's substantial damage that looks like it's not just wear and tear on the wings, then, then we rate them as having white nose. Uh, damage that occurred in the winter and then it's going to be a potential issue in the fall or in the winter. So what are we looking at exactly? This is, oh sorry, this is a, a bat hanging upside down. This is uh, its thumb, its ear, its nose, its other ear, and its other thumb. So it's facing like that. And it's hanging upside down in a, in a cave. And it's got the fungus, that's the fungus mold growing on it and uh, yeah. It causes wing damage, and like I said, they we don't know if they're waking up to fight the fight the white nose off, or if they're waking up because their fat stores are depleted and they just need to wake up and and eat. Basically, it, it wakes them up and they have to eat, and there's nothing nothing around for them to eat. So that's the map. As you can see, uh, it is spreading. It started here. This is where the uh, 2006 is where it started and first detected in New York, and since then. It's gone north and, and west, and it, it's, I think they pulled Oklahoma off, but it was, they did say they found some in Oklahoma, but it's just steadily spreading west, and like I said, here's, here's kind of the area where Indiana bats are really at, at risk, and it's 
kind of moving in on them, kind of surrounding it. And once it hits those areas, then it's going to be pretty bad. But uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, what I was reading was that they just they had sent some specimens back, and I don't I don't know if they were dead or if they had just taken some tissue samples of them, but um, from the samples, and I think I think on the Sudan one they sent in about 50 samples, and they found it uh, confirmed in about 10 bats. So um, I, I didn't I didn't I didn't it didn't say in there I didn't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there there was some, but like it, but it can be in those smaller caves. It can be 90 to 100 percent. But yeah, there was some some survivors, and and like I said, we test to see their wing damage because some of them it doesn't reach them right away in in the winter, and so it doesn't it doesn't attack them and kill them right away. It can just start to eat away, and they can survive it. And then, um, yeah, exactly. But they don't necessarily, even, even though they have wing damage, this goes back to your question, even though they have wing damage, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's sitting on them right now. They could have, they could be off of them. And it just because we're handling it doesn't mean like we should kill this bat because it has wing damage and it's got white nose. It had white nose then and it, it's probably going to come back, but it doesn't necessarily mean it has it. So we don't necessarily kill it right then and there. 